All right, so we're at a point now in our covenant study where I think it'd be good for us to do a little review, and I want to do that in a couple of ways. Um, one, not counting the Noahic covenant. How many covenants have we covered? And this would be just with Abraham and his descendants. Yeah, you can count them off if you need to. One, three. Four. 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 So I want to put somebody on the spot here, a couple of you, uh, but I'm going to let you volunteer to be put on the spot. <laughs> Think, I want you to start at Genesis 1 and use the covenants as an outline and just walk me through where we are now. Last week we finished what we call the Deuteronomic Covenant. So basically Genesis to Deuteronomy, I'm going to ask two of you to do this. One of you can do the halfway, use the first two covenants that we cover, and let's say bring us to Sinai. But I want you to start at Genesis 1, and the other one from Sinai up to the plains of Moab, where we finished last week. Do I have any volunteers to do this? I missed my, I missed my, I missed my, okay, we'll let you off Okay, I'll be willing to do, let me do the first part, and maybe somebody can, that'll help us understand what I'm talking about, maybe somebody else can take us from Sinai up to the plains of Moab. Start in Genesis 1, we have four key events in Genesis 1 through 11, the creation and six days of everything in the heavens and the earth with man, both male and female, uh, being the crown of that creation and the one that God appointed to be fruitful and multiply, rule the earth, subdue the earth and rule over it. Man fell very quickly into sin, plunging the whole creation under a curse. Um, man's depravity and his evil just continued to get worse and worse to the point where God had to judge the world. He did that through the flood. That's the third major event. After Noah and his family came off the ark, they were given the same commands to be fruitful and multiply, rule, subdue the earth and rule over it. And they did. But man once again rebelled against God. They were supposed to spread out all over the land, all over the earth. They gathered into one place and not only disobeyed scattering, but they also uh, built a tower up into heaven and really established their own religion in rebellion against the true God. So God brought another judgment. This time it was the confusion of tongues at the Tower of Babel that forced the people to scatter. Um, they scattered and developed into tribes and ultimately into nations. All that sets the background for what happens in Genesis 12, where God calls Abraham to leave his own family and his own country to and go to a place that God was going to show him. And, God promised him in the Abrahamic covenant that he would make a great name of him, that he would give him a multitude of descendants, whereas at that point he had none, that he would give him a particular land, a particular piece of real estate uh, where that nation would live, and that he would bless him. He would bless him personally, and he would bless his descendants as a people. And so for the rest of Genesis, you basically have the outworking of that covenant and it's confirmation to Abraham's descendants, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, his grandson Jacob. Um, And then you have Jacob being renamed to Israel and uh, the 12 tribes being formed. Well, as part of the Abrahamic covenant, God told Abraham ahead of time that his people would be uh, oppressed by a foreign nation for 400 years. Remember, initially they end up down in Egypt because of the famine and and because of Joseph's rulership down in Egypt that was done so well, he brings his family down there and it's within the womb of Egypt that the nation multiplies and becomes this great people. So much so that Egypt, as the most powerful military nation on the earth at that time, uh, fears them and begins to oppress them, just as predicted in the Abrahamic covenant. Well, uh, God eventually calls Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. He does that through a demonstration of great power through the ten plagues. Uh, Ultimately, even though along the way, Pharaoh hardens his heart at several points, and God hardens Pharaoh's heart so he can bring more plagues upon him and so he can show him his power. 
Ultimately, uh, Pharaoh lets the people go. They make their way down to Sinai. And there, God enters into the second covenant with them, the Mosaic covenant. That is the constitution of the nation of Israel. It's the means by which the blessings that were promised to the nation in the Abrahamic covenant is the means by which those will be fulfilled. And it is a covenant that God spells out what he requires of his people. He promises blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience, the ultimate curse being taken out of the land. Um, but even within that promise, or even within the statement that those curses would happen, in, including exile, God promises ultimate restoration for the people. He's not going to forsake them. All right. That gets us down to Sinai. They're there for about a year. Uh, they also, the book of Leviticus also talks about all the instruction they received on the various offerings they were to do. They build the tabernacle while they're at Sinai. Can somebody mm-hmm. use the other two covenants and take us from Sinai up to the plains of Moab? Largely through the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy. Not to great detail, but just summarizing. So you're talking about discussing the priestly covenant yep. and the Deuteronomy? That's right. And you can fill in whatever else on top of that that you want to talk about that's described in the book of Numbers. Again, not to any detail. Because I know the priestly covenant is just a small portion of the book of Numbers, and we haven't talked a lot about Numbers. But what, what happens in the book of Numbers? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know how to different. I, I would say, or is it in the book of Numbers that we learn about how they disobeyed and he blessed them and gave them what they wanted and they disobeyed again and it included um, um, trying to strip Moses of his authority and Aaron? Yeah, so basically Numbers is... Wilderness wanderings, right? Starting at Sinai, uh, they've already demonstrated that they they too are a rebellious people. Israel is, but the journey from Sinai up to the plains of Moab is marked by grumbling, complaining, rebellion, questioning Moses' authority. Uh, they finally get to Kadesh Barnea and they send twelve spies up into Sfat, the Promised Land, and the land is everything that God promised it would be. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But 10 of the 12 spies say the inhabitants are too large. There's no way that we can take that land. Again, they demonstrate their lack of faith and their unbelief. So that's the last straw for that generation. God says, I'm not going to let these guys come into the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb can do it out of that generation. They wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation comes out, dies out. And then they finally make it up to the plains of Moab. Moses has one last shot through the book of Deuteronomy to renew covenant with this new generation that wasn't there when they left out from Sinai. He does that. And it's basically Deuteronomy is a covenant type document, if you will, uh, that renews the Mosaic covenant with that generation. So again, I want you to see how these covenants provide an outline basically of the storyline particularly the Pentateuch, that's what we've covered so far is basically Genesis to Deuteronomy. That's where four of the six covenants that God <coughs> makes with Israel in particular, if you don't count the, Abraham, the Noahic covenant, four of them occur in the Pentateuch. Now we're getting ready to move out of the Pentateuch into the Davidic covenant. This is a quote that I included in our introductory lesson from John Walton. I thought it was worth revisiting. <coughs> According to Walton, God's revelation through his covenant program provides, quote, an overarching plan of God's revealing his character, his will, and his plan. Again, his plan is not just for the nation of Israel, although they are a key player in it. His plan is for the redemption of all the nations of the world. Israel is just the means by which he's planning to do that. In so doing, God provides a foundation for relationship with him, that is, Having a relationship with God so that you know him and you're becoming more like him. That's what he wants. He wants us to be holy as he is holy. That's what separates us from the rest of the created beings. We have this ability to relate to God, to know God, and he to know us in a special relationship. 
It also provides a means by which that relationship might be achieved, salvation. Now, for the Old Testament saint, it was believing God, taking him at his word, and acting on it. Uh, and it's the same for us. I mean, we, we have a different message than what the Old Testament saint did, but salvation has always been by grace through faith. It was then, it is now. And then the structure that will define that relationship, which is kingdom. Now, I think we're at somewhat of a disadvantage because we don't live in a monarchy, but certainly Israel did in her history. There's other countries today that do. But that is the form that when Christ comes back, he's going to establish. It won't be a democracy. It'll be a monarchy with a perfect monarch. And it'll, it'll rule according <clears throat> to the Mosaic law. So we're going to start moving now from the book of Deuteronomy. Think about Moses being uh, what we would call a mediatorial ruler. He wasn't a king, but he was the one that mediated between God and the people. Joshua did that same thing after him. We had a period of the judges where there was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. But eventually they moved to a monarchy with a king, and that's what we're going to talk about more today. The Davidic covenant takes place some 400 years after the covenant, or after they got up to the plains of Moab, and Moses gives his last exhortations to the people. Israel eventually fails to completely drive out the inhabitants of the land, as God had commanded her to, even though Joshua was successful in his initial campaign to break all the major resistance, the individual tribes were not successful in driving out the inhabitants of their allotments. And Joshua warns them at the end of that book that the foreigners who remained in the land would become a snare and a trap to you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. As we move into the book of Judges, Judges 2.10 states that after Joshua's generation, there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. So you understand the importance of transmitting truth from generation to generation. I mean, it was very easy to lose sight of the fact of things that God had done if that transmission of truth hadn't taken place faithfully, and in this case it hadn't. That begins what we call a spiraling down, uh, this recorded force in the book of Judges, where the people would walk with the Lord for a while, then they'd become turned away towards idolatry by those inhabitants that were still left in the land. They would become oppressed. They would cry out to God for deliverance, and he would bring a new judge to deliver them, and then the cycle would start all over again. I say cycle. It wasn't really like this or like this. It was like this. It was going down. It was getting worse and worse each time it uh, repeated itself. And the people grew tired of this spiral, and they asked for a king. Now, this is a little bit of a paradox, because on the one hand, we know that there were kings anticipated all the way back to the promises to Abraham and Sarah, right? They, they were told that kings would come forth from them. And Moses lays out for us, in Deuteronomy 17, of a future day when Israel will have a king, even before they first came into the land, even before the period of the judges. But their reason for wanting a king was not a good one. And we read about this in 1 Samuel 8, beginning verse 1. It came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, the name of his second Abijah, they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, old, and Samuel had a good reputation as a judge, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. And again, when we think about judging in this context, it's not, even though they did some of this as far as the way that judges today decide cases or decide between people who have a dispute with each other, these were leaders and warrior leaders in particular. This thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, 
but they have rejected me from being king over them. Israel already had a king. They had the perfect king with the ultimate power. The king had already won many battles for them decisively and miraculously. And now they're asking for a human king. You can tell, obviously, that it's not pleasing to God, but he grants their wish. And, I mean, they end up having a kingdom that runs through the Old Testament. Christ himself is going to be king over Israel and all the nations when he comes back. So it's a bit of an accommodation on the one hand, at least for the reason that they asked for a king. They've rejected me from being king over them, like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you should solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. Every time you have a king, uh, you lose something in the sense that they're going to take the best of your crops, the best of your animals, even the best of your people, and bring them into their court to serve them. They didn't have to worry about that when God was their king, but that's what's going to happen to them, and, and Samuel warns them about that. Uh, but even with God's granting this human king to them, he's still ruling that king is on God's behalf. He's God's king, and, and God is still ultimately king over Israel as well. So they asked for a king, Saul was Israel's first king. <clears throat> he started out well enough. He was chosen by God, but he wasn't completely devoted to the Lord as evidenced mainly by two things. Anybody tell me what those are? What did Saul do that caused his downfall? When he goes into the temple, he didn't wait for God to, uh, for the, the prophet to come back to him with the answer that he had asked for so he and he said well you didn't come back so i had to i had to go into the temple and, and do the sacrifice he offered the sacrifice instead of waiting grew impatient that <clears> way uh his offering of burnt offerings instead of waiting on samuel actually to come back we read about this in first samuel 13 verse 8 he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by samuel but samuel did not come to gilgal and the people were scattering from him uh, samuel was late getting back. So Saul said, bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. He offered the burnt offering. It came out as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering. Then behold, Samuel came. Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering for me and that you did not come within the appointed days and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal I have not asked the favor of the Lord. I mean, it sounds like a decent case that he's making, right? Yeah. So I forced myself and <laughs> offered the burnt offering. <clears throat> and is God pleased with that? Is Samuel pleased with that? No. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you've not kept what the Lord commanded you. So that was his first big mistake. And it seems as if, from this passage, his fate is already sealed. There was another incident. What was it? When he didn't kill Agag. He didn't kill Agag. And David referred to this in his message this morning. Uh, he not only didn't kill Agag, but he didn't completely destroy all that they overtook. This is in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15, beginning verse 7. <coughs> Saul defeated the Amalekites <coughs> from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and order, utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. They were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. What was wrong with that? <coughs> it's disobedient. And they were supposed to completely wipe them out. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king. He's turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. 
But because of Saul's downfall, because of these two things, especially, God chose David, a man described as a man after God's own heart, to be Israel's new king. And we see uh, through the book of 1 Samuel this tension between Saul and David. On the one hand, David sometimes plays music for Saul in his court. On the other hand, uh, Saul is out killing and tries to on a couple of occasions. David, remember at one point, David has Saul dead to rights in the cave. He doesn't know he's in there. He sneaks up and cuts off a piece of his robe, but he doesn't lay his hand on Saul because he knows he's God's anointed and ultimately God will be the one to take care of him. So we see a lot of David's character come through in his interaction with Saul. When David goes up against Goliath and, and Saul says, I will give you, you know, my daughter, etc., etc." Is it after that that he's still trying to kill David because of David's popularity? Yes. Yeah, he becomes very jealous. He has jealousy and self ambition I heard about this morning. And you remember the incident where Saul has killed, the, the ladies are out dancing and proclaiming praise, and Saul has killed his thousands, thousands and David his ten thousands. Yeah. So he's very much jealous of David. But David does eventually assume the throne at about age 30. After his capture of Jerusalem from the Jebusites and two decisive battles over the Philistines, David was a warrior. He was really good at wiping out Philistines. David brings the ark back to Jerusalem and there establishes the city as the center of Israelite worship. I'm not going to read out of 2 Samuel 5 and 6, but that's what's being described in those chapters. And then, having been re given rest by the Lord from all his enemies, and having built a house of cedar for himself, he looks out and sees, you know, I've got this house of cedar, but the ark of God is still dwelling in a tent. That's not right. I want to build a house for the Lord. We, we see this account. This is right before the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It came about when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that's in your mind, for the Lord is with you. That's kind of an interesting thing there. The prophet is saying that without consulting God. Turns out that's not going to be the case, right? God's not going to let David be the one to build the house. And it came about in the same night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? In essence, God is saying, Look, I haven't asked for this house. I mean, you just come up with this idea. Uh, but you're not going to be the one to do that. This is immediately prior to the covenant itself that begins uh, in verse 8. <clears throat> Second Samuel 7, verses 8 through 17. Um, let's read these, and then we'll walk through uh, the different promises. <clears throat> now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. Don't read through that too fast. I mean, this guy was out there shepherding sheep. He learned a lot through that. He evidently became very courageous. He could deal with lions and bears. He uh, wrote psalms, I'm sure, while he was out there looking at the stars. But God took him from that lowly position of being a shepherd and is going to make him the king of all Israel. I took you from the pasture from following the sheep that you should be ruler over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies before you. And I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. Does that remind you of anything? I will make you a great name. Abraham. 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 Same kind of promise that was made to Abraham. Uh, David perhaps is not as well known as Abraham if you consider Islam and Judaism and Christianity, but certainly he's well known within Judaism and Christianity. He's a hero. 
I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the afflicted, I'm sorry, nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, so he's looking back at that period of time, I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Remember, all this started with David wanting to make a house for the Lord, and he was talking about a physical structure, a temple. But what kind of house is God talking about making for David? A family line, a royal dynasty, a house in that sense. And that term is still used today in that sense, right? The house of Windsor or the house regarding a particular king. <clears throat> he will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed or your descendants, descendant singular here, after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And he is again talking about a physical structure there. Who is that descendant that's going to build that house? Solomon. The Solomon. <clears throat> I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. That's a really important statement. That's the relationship that the king of Israel was to have with the true king of Israel. It's a father-son relationship, uh, one of intimacy, one also of authority. Uh, the son was to rule on behalf of the father. The son, as the king, was to rule in accordance with the regulations that the father had given in the Mosaic law. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. I will discipline him as he needs it. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. So, He's contrasting what he did with Saul in taking the kingdom away from him. He's saying, look, your line, David, is going to uh, be an everlasting line. It doesn't mean that every one of those characters, those kings are going to be perfect, and I will discipline them as necessary, but I'll never take the, the line out of your family. So I don't believe Solomon was the firstborn, well, the firstborn son with Bathsheba passed away, you know that, but he was not the firstborn son of, of David. How is it that Solomon became his heir? God providentially chose him? Or? Yes, he, he chose him to be the <clears throat> one to be the king and to, to build a temple. Uh, over, over even the firstborn, does it look like he had yes. done in the past with Abraham's descendants? That's right. Firstborn had special blessing. I don't think it necessarily <clears throat> means that they would be the king even as the line continues down you know, from Solomon forward. We also have instances where God reversed the process, right? And blessed right. somebody other than the firstborn. Right. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, even as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Now, I don't know if you caught this as I was reading through that. I called that the Davidic covenant. The term covenant appears nowhere in that passage. Why do we think it is a covenant then? Maybe the structure. Okay. Structure would be a possibility. It's referred to as a covenant later. That's the strongest argument. And so... I mean, certainly there's there's really firm promises made here, but every other place that we've talked about and looked at is a covenant. It's called a covenant. It's not called that here, but it is. And we'll look at the later references. Psalm 89 in particular looks back on this event and calls it a covenant. But also the structure of it. It's kind of like the structure of it is like if you do this or whatever, I'll, you know, I'm going to do this. And it's like God making a promise sort of to, to David. Exactly. That is what it is. <clears throat> it's just striking to me that, you know, that it's not called a covenant within this immediate context, but I don't think there's any doubt that that's what it is. So we can say these promises are divided up into two parts. One promises that would be fulfilled in David's lifetime, verses 9 through 11a, and then promises to be fulfilled after David's death 
and 11b through 14. We already talked about the fact that God was going to make a great name of David. He does that when in his lifetime, uh, that great name lives on today. A place for the people. This goes all the way back to Genesis 12. Even before the formal formalized covenant with Abraham, there was a promise of a specific land for the people. And it's an element in this covenant as well. And rest. Rest from his enemies. Now we read earlier in chapter 7 that he already had that, even as God was making this covenant with him. But there's also an ultimate rest that's going to be had that Israel still hasn't enjoyed up to this point in history. But those are the three that are fulfilled in David's lifetime. And then now the ones after his death. We talked about a house, a lineage, the fact that his line would never be extinguished. A seed or a descendant. Again, Solomon is the one that's immediately being referred to here and the one that's going to build the temple. And his kingdom will be established. Again, he'll be the first in a long line of descendants of David that uh, <clears throat> that always have the kingship, always have somebody that sits on the throne from that line. And then kingdom itself, uh, verse 13 he shall build a house for name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So if we summarize all this, God promised to David a great name and under his leadership as king, he would provide a secure place for the nation, <coughs> the land to dwell in. And all that, again, you can see the connection of that with the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Yahweh also promised that a descendant of David, not David himself, would build the temple and that the Davidic dynasty would endure forever. To, to really summarize the essence of the covenant is that David would never lack a man to sit upon God's throne in Jerusalem. We have references to that in 1 Kings 8, 2 Chronicles 6, and Jeremiah 33. Let me read those to you. 1 Kings 8, 25. Uh, this is in the context of Solomon's prayer of dedication after the temple. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father that which thou hast promised him, saying, You shall not like a man to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take heed to their way to walk before me as you have walked. We've talked about these covenants and how there's certain unconditional aspects to them. I mean, God is going to guarantee that uh, David's descendants the kingdom stays within their line. But at the same time, there's responsibility on their part that they walk according to the ways of the Lord. Second Chronicles 6.16 says basically the same thing. It's the same prayer. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father, which thou hast promised him, saying, You shall not like a man to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take heed to their way to walk in my law, as you have walked before me. And again, that law is the law that was given through the Mosaic Covenant. And then Jeremiah 33 is one that we've read before. Thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man before me <coughs> to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and prepare sacrifices continually. That last section being the priestly covenant that we covered from Numbers 25, and the sons of Zadok being the ones that show up in the millennial kingdom and fulfillment of that. I know I've shown you this diagram before. To me, it's really helpful to summarize a lot of the Old Testament, particularly in Kings and Chronicles. Uh, you have a united kingdom under Saul for about 112 years, Saul, David, and then Solomon. Um, the kingdom divides because of Solomon's sin in 931 BC, 10 of the tribes going north, uh, all the kings of the north being bad kings. And they came from several different lines or families. But the southern kingdom is the line of David. That's the one to whom the covenant promises are made. Two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, they had a lot of bad kings as well, but they had some bright spots in there with eight good kings. Northern kingdom, because of their idolatry, in, ends up being taken into captivity by Assyria in 722 BC. The southern kingdom last a little bit longer. They have a three-stage captivity. Uh, 605, Daniel and his three friends are taken captive. Uh, 
uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, 597, Ezekiel, and 10,000 others, and then ultimately uh, Jerusalem is destroyed in 586 B.C. The last king on the Davidic throne was a guy named Metaniah, whose name was changed by the king of Babylon to Zedekiah. He was the last king of the southern kingdom, and there has been no king since. Uh, Christ came in the line of David, and of course, everybody understood that he had to come in the line of David. And that's why Matthew goes to such great pains to show that he's in the line of David in his gospel. He never ruled from the throne in Jerusalem. Um, he offered the kingdom and it was rejected. So he sits on a throne now to be sure, but that's the father's throne in heaven. He's at his right hand. What he promises to the overcomer in the book of Revelation is that when he comes back, those who have overcome will sit down with him on his throne just as he sat down with his father on his throne but the, the davidic throne is in jerusalem uh, that's where all the other davidic kings reign from and that's where christ will reign from at his return all right we've talked about how these covenants work together and i want perhaps you've seen some of these connections already as you've as we've read through the passage in the Davidic covenant, but it's interesting to me to, to put them in a chart form like this, help you see them better. International reputation, God was going to make of David a great name, just as he promised Abraham in Genesis 12. The land inheritance has been an important part, not only of the Abrahamic covenant, but the blessings of the Mosaic covenant are all tied to the land. Descendants, uh, we know that Abraham was promised a multitude of descendants. Even when he had none, they were going to be like the dust of the earth or the sand of the seashore, like the stars of heaven. And that's part of the Davidic covenant as well. It's a little bit different in that he's talking about a particular descendant that's going to be born and the kingdom is going to be guaranteed to him and he's going to be the one to build the temple. But descendants are still a big part of the covenant. And this relationship of sonship, we already saw with the Davidic covenant, but Israel also was considered God's son, right? Deuteronomy 4.20, the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession this today. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Exodus 4.22 and 23, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Again, that's a very intimate kind of relationship. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you've refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son. He's talking to Pharaoh here. Your firstborn. Um, not only did God kill the firstborn of Pharaoh, but also the firstborn of all the others in Egypt who didn't put the blood on the doorpost and lintel. And then another uh, sign of intimate relationship is my people. This is the one I read earlier. The Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as today. We saw that in the Mosaic Covenant 2 in Exodus 19. Uh, you, should be, uh, you should be my people, I will be your God. And that's the reference that we have in 2 Samuel 7 as well. Connections between the Mosaic and the Davidic Covenants not next Sunday, but in two Sundays, we'll look at some of these, what are classified as royal psalms that speak about the Davidic dynasty. They speak about the, the king of the southern kingdom, Judah, being on the throne. And they depict that king as one who rules according to the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant. As you read through 2 Kings chapters 18 through 23, you see that the measuring stick for the reigns of the king's Hezekiah, Manasseh, and Josiah are the stipulation of the Mosaic Covenant. Let, let me just read you a few passages out of this so that you can see these. This first one's talking about Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18. Came about in the end of the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. So it's really, I think it's fair to say that the measuring stick was both keeping the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant and David as 
the one who had preceded them and who had walked with the Lord faithfully. He removed the high places, broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. This is Hezekiah. So that after him, there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. So that's a very positive impression of Hezekiah because he kept covenant with God. Manasseh is on the other end of that spectrum. <clears throat> Second Kings 21. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord dis dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Again, you can see that influence of the ones that did not get driven out, ultimately influenced towards idolatry. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, a sacred pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord. Or was, he built altars to other gods within the temple complex. Of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. For he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his son pass through the fire, practiced witchcraft and used divination, and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And then we have another bright spot with Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkoth. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his father David, nor did he turn aside from the right or to the left. So again, David as the standard against which the other kings were measured, and David as the one who kept covenant with God, who kept his commandments. Not perfectly. David sinned as well, but he repented. He, In general, the course of his life was one that was after God, God's own heart and in obedience to his covenant stipulations. Grisani uh, is the one that wrote the article on the Davidic covenant, in that same series of articles that I've sent you before on some of the others, he states it well in saying that the proper role of the Davidic king was to lead his people in keeping Torah. You see that in Deuteronomy 17. Uh, we see the examples of those who did and did not do that in First and Second Kings. <coughs> All right, that's part one of the Davidic covenant. In two weeks, we'll start looking at some of these psalms probably read one of them next week as, as part of our scripture, scripture reading. But we'll look at these psalms that reflect on this Davidic covenant and on the relationship that God has with his Davidic ruler. Questions? Kathleen? Isn't there a passage that says Manasseh had a change of heart at the end of his life after he got leprosy in his feet? Was that Manasseh? I'd have to look. I'm Should be in Second Kings. Yeah, but it was too late. He'd already led everybody into sin. Yeah, it, I mean, as the king went, so went the people, and there were disastrous consequences for bad leadership. And also, I remember where it says in Second Second Samuel twelve, when when Solomon was born, it says, and God loved him. Yeah, so Solomon's a really interesting character too. One, because he had this guarantee of the line through him, but at the end of his life, his heart was turned away from the Lord as well. And God was angry with him. You read about in uh, 1 Kings 11. Uh, it's really strong condemnation of what he had done. And he violated the very things that God had laid out for kings to not to do in Deuteronomy 17. So... Uh, and Ecclesiastic is, is Ecclesiastics is his regret, and he is tells it, us. Is it, is it, what is that before his 
I don't think it's before. I think it's written near the end of his life, and I think he is reflecting on all the things that he did over the so course of his life. After all of that, after everything he did, he had time to write that book out? Oh, Solomon was an extremely gifted man. Remember, when he had the opportunity to ask for anything that he wanted to for the Lord, he asked for wisdom. And I think part of that wisdom was his ability to write and think about all the things that he composed as far as Proverbs and collecting other Proverbs, book like Ecclesiastes, some he, of the songs. Did he, he repent? So, I mean, that's the common way that a lot of people refer to Ecclesiastes. Um, certainly in Ecclesiastes, he's very orthodox in his understanding of uh, fearing God. The key when all has been heard is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's how he concludes the book. So, <clears throat> I mean, I think you can take that as a statement of repentance. Again, it's hard to nail down exactly at po- what point I would write in Ecclesiastes. I think it's easy enough to say he wrote it towards the end of his life, well after all the experiences that he'd had, but exactly where, it's hard to know. And it didn't. It was too late to even affect his son. Yeah, I mean, you can see that all over the place, right? You can have a godly father... Uh, even the one that doesn't go off the rails and his sons don't follow after him. We read about that in Samuel this morning. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't forget about FOF tonight. Again, we'll have our State of the Church address. Sounds like a presidential address. So State of the Church <laughs> update <laughs> in our <laughs> second <laughs> hour. <laughs> and, uh, Let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Fathers, it's, we're so thankful for the revelation of your word, for all of your word. And for me, I think about how understanding the earlier part of your revelation, understanding your unfolding plan of redemption, particularly through these covenants, helps us understand the New Testament better. It helps us understand what Christ means when he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Helps us understand why we have the genealogies that trace Christ's lineage back to David and back to Abraham. I think it also helps us understand the distinction between Israel and the church, both glorious institutions that you've founded, uh, but different, different from each other, distinct from each other. And yet again, similar in many of their roles, uh, certainly similar in that both are reconciled to you, ultimately. The church is Jew and Gentile in one body reconciled today, getting the spiritual benefits of the new covenant ahead of the nation of Israel. But Israel being the root and trunk of the tree and the one through whom Messiah came, the one through whom we have the scriptures So, Lord, help us to to see properly our place in your plan of redemption. Uh, We rejoice and exult in the history that we are part of as believers in Christ today. And we also look forward to the future when Christ will come and and finish out uh, his earthly ministry, ruling for a thousand years on this planet. Uh, before we enter into a new heavens and new earth and the curse is done away with. Help us to live in light of that. Help us to walk in wisdom. Help us to honor you from the innermost parts of our being. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.